All right, holy cow, here we are. We're at lecture 54. We're toward the end. We're preparing for the exam, uh, or the exams as the case may be. And um, we probably only have a couple of, I only have planned another couple of lectures left after this. So we are down to the end. And today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about probably one of the, uh, one of the more pressing issues that actually you guys who are watching this is facing today, and that is the war on terror. Now, previous to the war, of course, you know, previous to the war on terror, when I think back about... Um, when I think back about a young Mr. Andosha who was sitting in his, uh, uh, you know, 11th grade, 12th grade uh, U.S. history classes um, uh, with Mrs. Brotherton, thank you, Mrs. Brotherton, um, and, uh, and thinking about the, uh, the military issues that we were facing at the time, it really was not, it had, it was, it, the, these were things that were based on the Cold War. Um, so how do we get here? How do we get to the point where what we are actually facing is instead of being involved in a conflict with another easily identifiable country, we find ourselves involved in a conflict with well, uh, a tactic, really, because that's what terrorism is. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, exactly how do we fight a tactic? Um, and, uh, well, you know, I'll leave that up to you guys to, to figure out. So today we're going to talk about Lecture 54, uh, From the Cold War to a War on Terror. And... Um, and the essential question that we're going to deal with, or the essential, uh, you know, uh, goal of the uh, of the task is, uh, we're going to analyze the process by which the United States shifted its military posture from a Cold War footing, basically, to a war on terror footing, which is pretty significant because at least with the Cold War, we had an idea of whom we were in conflict with. Well, we kind of have, sort of have that idea now, um, although we're going to have to think about exactly what we mean by the enemy in more generalized terms. Um, well, we're going to have to reshape the uh, America's military. Look, the, the bottom line is, is, uh, is that during, the, during this period, uh, we were facing the fact that we had just gotten out of a, um, a devastating war, a war that we did not win and a war that had tremendous, tremendous uh, negative consequences for the country, both financially in the terms of, uh, of our living human treasure and also in, in terms of U.S. Um, you know, identity and sense of self. Um, so when, uh, when President Reagan takes office in 1980s, of course, he is dedicated to a military, to a strong military posture. Um, remember, conservatism is about, um, you know, uh, holding on to and maintaining and perpetuating traditional um, institutions. And the most traditional of our institutions, at least one of the most traditional of our institutions, is the military. So uh, as part of the conservative movement, of course, uh, President Reagan is going to be very interested in perpetuating the military and making the military much stronger. Plus, uh, we kind of want to, we kind of need to rebuild, right? We need to take a look at this at our military and see well, what went wrong in Vietnam. Uh, and of course, the debates abound. Uh, were there uh, mistakes as far as how we were prepared militarily? Were there were there, uh, were there diplomatic errors? Were there bureaucratic government errors? And of course, the answer to these questions is yes. Uh, so we want to take a closer look at the military and figure out, well, exactly how can we design a military that's going to serve our purposes in the, uh, in, in the coming millennium? Um, and this is kind of referred to as the Vietnam Syndrome, as basically an overall reluctance on the part of the United States to actually get involved in uh, major long-term uh, military conflicts. And this is not to say that we're not going to get into any military conflicts. We got into all kinds of military conflicts. We've always been involved in some kind of a military conflict. Uh, the, great, uh, the great American essayist and, and social critic Gore Vidal uh, once put out a list of the number of military operations that we've had uh, from World War II until 9-11, um, and he came up with about 250 of them. Uh, so, and that's just military operations. It, that's not including, uh, you know, State Department CIA-based operations and proxy wars and things along those lines. So, uh, so we've, we're still going to be involved in, in, in you know, the, uh, the U.S. military is still going to be actively involved and engaged in the world, but how exactly do we want to do this? So, um, so President Reagan is going to kind of shift some things with regard to our military posture. Well, one thing is we are going to increase our funding for the military. We are going to uh, spend more money. And, and uh, Reagan's uh, increase of military spending during his administration is going to represent one of the largest increases in military spending uh, during peacetime that the United States has ever seen. Um, 
Also, too, we're not, we're going to be kind of choosy, picky, and choosy about how we use our military. For the most part, if we have a problem in another country that needs to, a military solution, we're probably going to try to find people there uh, who already live in those countries to fight these wars. Uh, we're going to call, we can call these proxy wars, all right? We're going to have other people doing the fighting for us. Um, but when we do have a, uh, have a military problem in which the American troops are going to have to go onto the ground and actually do some fighting, we want to make sure that, these, that the missions are relatively short and very well defined. We don't want to spend, we don't want to be bogged down in a long-term war that can ultimately turn public opinion against it. Uh, one of the things that we are going to learn from Vietnam is when the people of a nation uh, stop supporting a war, then the war is pretty much over. Uh, we can't perpetuate it as, as easily. <laughs> so, uh, President Reagan, and, and of course, uh, you know, maximizing this, President Bush is actually going to uh, expand on this idea uh, much more so than President Reagan does. Um, and also, uh, a key note, a, a key provision of Reagan's military posture was also nuclear. Okay, we have a large nuclear arsenal. A lot of us are starting to question the idea of whether or not we need weapons that can, oh, I don't know, destroy the world. Um, and yet, Reagan doesn't really have a problem with this. Uh, and in fact, his, his uh, idea is, hey, let's create create a shield over the United States so that when foreign countries are shooting missiles at us, um, those missiles can't actually hit us. And that way there, we're able to, um, you know, we're, we're able to defend ourselves. So he put together what was called SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars. Um, of course, this was a violation of treaties that we already had with the, with the, um, with the Soviet Union at the time, because according to the Soviet Union, well, if you have a defense against our missiles, that means that you have a first strike capability, and we had already agreed that we're not going to do that, that we're not going to create this first, this kind of first strike capability. So, uh, so SDI has been very contentious, but he went through with it, followed through with it, we're still working on it, haven't got it yet, uh, we've spent billions of dollars on this particular initiative. Now, George H.W. Bush is, is pretty much going to follow through. I mean, uh, one example, uh, for instance, is the United States invasion of, of Grenada that was done under Pre President Reagan. We kind of talked about this, I think, last, uh, last uh, lecture a little bit. Uh, under George H.W. Bush, we're also going to see very much the same thing. So, for instance, when we had a conflict with Panama, we had a guy in charge of Panama, Manuel, Manuel Noriega, whom we wanted to get out of there. Um, we, we did, in fact, put boots on the ground. We did attack, um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to go in with overwhelming strength. So we ended up invading Panama uh, with overwhelming strength, very, very quick, very, very violent. Um, but once we got the, once we achieved the mission by you know capturing and arresting Manuel Noriega, um, the mission was over. We left. Period. End of story. So, uh, which is exactly what we did in Panama. It was kind of a practice run, um, and. Um, now, President Bush, uh, President H.W. Bush, is going to preside over probably one of the most, uh, probably one of the best um, organized wars in American history, of course, uh, and this is going to be the Persian Gulf War. We see him here in Kuwait shaking the hands of soldiers. Um, now, uh, what, what ends up happening? What's going to happen? Well, basically, our guy in Iraq is a fellow by the name of Saddam Hussein. Uh, we supported Saddam Hussein. He was an ally of ours. He was fighting against the Iranians. We didn't like the Iranians. Um, so we did put an awful lot of money and investment into, uh, into making sure that he had the weapons that he needed to fight against the Iranians. Uh, this war was absolutely devastating for Iraq and Iran, um, but either way, he's, he's in charge. Well, um, Saddam Hussein decided he's going to expand his territories. He expands out and says, hey, you know what? I am going to invade my neighboring nation of Kuwait. I'm going to do this for a couple of reasons. One, I have some kind of a dubious claim as to the, fa as to the idea that Kuwait was originally a part of Iraq. Eh. Um, also, too, uh, it is going to increase my access to the Persian Gulf. And, hey, it's got oil fields. We like oil fields. So we're going to invade Kuwait. Um, Saddam Hussein will invade Kuwait. And officially, the Bush administration said, hey, wait a minute, you can't invade Kuwait. It is a sovereign nation that is illegal. You can't do it. And get out. And uh, Saddam Hussein went, I don't, I don't want to leave. So, uh, so we invaded. And, and um, now there's a lot more to this story, of course. Um, than that, of course, the fact that the Bush family actually owns oil fields in Kuwait, and the fact that uh, that um, that it's, that you know the uh, 
the nego- that, that we could have spent a little bit more time on negotiation. Hey, look, uh, when this war broke out, I was against the war, uh, and I spoke out against the war. So, uh, so my position in this is a little bit biased. Um, but either way, uh, these were the, this was the rationale. Uh, Iraq did, in fact, invade this country, and that isn't cool. You can't invade another country. So the United States uh, decided to go in and do something about it. But in this case, uh, there are a couple of things that the Bush administration put into effect that actually turned out to be pretty good ideas, uh, pretty good ideas as wars go. Um, there was some deviousness as well. Um, but uh, for one thing, uh, President Bush is going to make sure that he has, a, he has international support for what he's doing. He wants to get in other countries involved in this and understanding this stuff. Uh, secondly, he wants to make sure that when we move in, uh, or now this is the first major military um, event, the first military movement since Vietnam. We want to make sure that we, instead of a slow increase of troops, that basically we're going, in, like we did in Vietnam, we're going in with overwhelming force, um, moving into these regions with, with just overwhelming force, overwhelming the, uh, the Iraqi military, and, and winning rapidly. Uh, and secondly, we want to, or thirdly rather, we want to clearly define uh, exactly what our strategies are, uh, exactly what is our goal. All right? And when we achieve that goal, what are we going to do? And in this case, the goal was simply, let's take, get the Iraqis out of Kuwait. Get them out of there. That's not their country. Um, and, um, and that's exactly what uh, President Bush, with his leadership team, uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf and, uh, and um, General Colin Powell, uh, they, they planned this, uh, this attack. And, um, and it was very well done. I mean, uh, the... Uh, the Heavy bombing was, uh, was used to set the stage. Uh, by the time the bombing was over, American soldiers landed um, and um, relatively easily were able to drive the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. Um, oftentimes, after having experienced uh, this, this heavy and colossal bombing, many of these Iraqi uh, soldiers just flat out gave up and surrendered right off of the bat. Um, and um, not to diminish the things that the, the U.S. soldiers did when they were there, uh, this was still very, very tricky fighting, and it was very, still very risky. And, and, uh, and a number of Americans did, in fact, die, although casualties were very, were very, very low from this war. Um, outcomes of this, we did in fact drive uh, a Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, um, but President Bush stopped at the Iraqi border. Um, he did not invade Iraq. He did not want to get involved in that because that would involve us in a long-term uh, military struggle that he was not sure how to extract himself from. So he wisely chose not to do that. Anyway, um, so we, we did this, and now we, of course, did Saddam Hussein. He had been our guy. I mean, he was a brutal dictator, but he was our brutal dictator. Uh, well, now we lost that. No, we have an enemy in, uh, in Iraq. Also, too, uh, we wanted to topple. We wanted Saddam Hussein out of Iraq. We wanted to get him out of there, but we weren't willing to invade the country. So we decided to institute very intensive uh, sanctions, international sanctions against Iraq, um, limiting the things that they could have, making sure that they couldn't get things like pesticides that could then be turned into weapons, uh, especially weapons of mass destruction. We put in... Um, people there to find the weapons of mass destruction that we had largely allowed him to have or gave to him directly um, and to take get them out of Iraq to, to make sure that he wasn't a, that he didn't have that kind of attack capability. Uh, we also did fairly periodic bombing runs on Iraq, protecting a no-fly zone and uh, really, really keeping the thumbscrews down on Iraq as a nation. Um, and also, uh, the uh, President Bush also kind of suggested that uh, the uh, the you know the, the Vietnam syndrome is over. It, no, it wasn't quite. I wouldn't go so quite so far as that. Um, of course, also what, what happened during uh, George H. W. Bush's presidency is the fall of the Soviet Union, during which um, the uh, the Soviet. Uh, negotiator, Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet diplomat by the name of Georgi Arbatov says, we are going to do something terrible to you Americans. Uh-oh. Uh, we are going to deprive you of an enemy. Well, fear not. <laughs> uh, there's always another enemy. There's always another enemy, and it looks like we got one in Iraq. Um, President Clinton is pretty much going to follow much of the same protocols laid down by Reagan and Bush uh, during this time. Um, he is uh, he is largely going to avoid long term uh, you know long term military actions. In essence, uh, there are a couple of moments, for instance, uh, in the Balkans, specifically in Bosnia and in Kosovo, um, President Clinton is going to. Um, 
is going to say, uh, we're going to provide air support uh, in those regions because what was happening is ethnic Serbians in that region, the region had kind of broken down after the fall of the Soviet Union and was experiencing ethnic tensions. Uh, the Serbians uh, at that time were taking advantage of that and kind of and killing ethnic Croats and Muslims and Albanians and things. Uh, so we're going to go, we'll, we'll give you air support, we're going to do some bombings and stuff, um, but we're really not going to get too involved in these regions. Uh, we're not willing to really spend an awful lot of time putting boots on the ground, and that's exactly what President Clinton did. Um, and NATO uh, with the help of our allies in NATO, he was able to kind of, uh, you know, squelch some of the uh, what, what was being referred to as genocide at that time. Although there are some indications that the genocide actually escalated after the bombings. Um, but either way, this was his policy. Um, now, we no longer have this enemy, the Soviet Union, and yet we still have military problems going back. Now, these, these military problems go back quite a long ways, and we refer to them as terrorism. Right? Now, I've got to understand that terrorism is a tactic. Terrorism isn't a, isn't a nation. There's no nation of terrorism, uh, as much as we may think there is. Um, terrorism is a tactic. Terrorism is usually a tactic that is used by uh, folks who are relatively weak against folks who are relatively very, very powerful. It is a means by which of, of, uh, of aggressively and violently uh, striking at a, at a, a more powerful enemy. Um, in essence, the, uh, the, the definition of terrorism is simply any violence or threat of violence that is used to, uh, for a political gain, that is used to, uh, you know, to either undermine a nation's government or to, uh, to overpower that nation's government. So, uh, so this is terrorism by its definition, and probably the big... Now, we, we've had, we have terrorists all over the place. There's terrorists in every, uh, on every continent. There's terrorists from every culture. But most of the problems that the United States is having with regard to terrorism, most of the focus of the United States on terrorism does has to have to center around the Middle East. Well, why? Um, and this is really important to understand because um, we tend to put racial stereotypes and attach those to our perceived enemies. Um, and in this case, uh, these perceived enemies happen to come from the Middle East. So is there something innate about Middle Easterners that makes them terrorists? And of course, the answer is definitively no. Um, Terrorism is the outgrowth of certain uh, historical and social contexts that are taking place in certain, in, in certain areas. Um, and in, with regard to the Middle East, we see a tremendous amount of instability in these regions. Right? Uh, since the Ottoman Empire fell in, in the early 1920s, these regions had been splintered and fractured. Uh, they had been controlled by European powers, namely England, uh, France, and ultimately the United States. Uh, they've become the playing field uh, you know, for the Cold War for a while. Uh, there, have been, there are nationalist movements developing in, the, in these regions. Uh, some of these nationalist movements have been uh, co contentious, um, such as those that are developing in, in Egypt and, and other areas. Um, and and also these nationalist movements have become kind of like uh, the pawns in the larger Cold War struggle that has been going on. So what we're looking at here, uh, come the 1980s, is we're looking at over half of a century of, uh, of conflict that has been taking place. Um, the United States has, has oftentimes supported the state of Israel, whereas the state of Israel is not considered to be very, very popular in the Middle East, specifically b uh, based on the treatment of uh, Palestinian people who lived in that region um, before it was Israel. And, um, and a just resolution of this particular conflict between Israel and Palestine has not yet been made, uh, and with very, very little progress on this score. So, uh, so this ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine uh, extends out to the rest of the Middle Eastern world and to the Arab world especially. Uh, the conflict that, exists between, that existed between Iraq and Iran was also another, uh, another issue. In Iraq, uh, the, uh, the population in Iraq was largely uh, a branch of Islam called Shia. Uh, they are Shiites. Well, Iran is is pretty much exclusively Shiite. So uh, the fear, of course, in Iraq was that Iran was going to exert influence over the Shiites that existed in Iraq. H hence, we have tension between Iraq and Iran that, that ultimately led to a very devastating war uh, that was funded by the United States. So the United States is involved in this particular conflict. Um, also, too, we talked about the uh, invasion of Russia and Afghanistan, in which the United States is going to get involved 
involved in this as well by funding uh, groups whom the uh, Russians would have identified as terrorists. Now we got to understand uh, this is this is one of the more contentious aspects of this, of this particular study. The understanding that hey look this video is on YouTube. This video is going all over the world and is watched by people all over the world. We have to kind of understand that. I, you know I look at my data and I see there are people uh, in the Middle East who have seen these videos. Um, and we do have to kind of take into consideration the fact that, hey, what one particular group uh, identifies as being terrorists, another particular group doesn't. Another group may actually uh, think that the, that the terrorist actions, that these violence, uh, violent actions are heroic. Um, and that, um, and that these are, say, freedom fighters or fighting for a larger cause. Uh, and this is the case in Afghanistan, of course. Uh, the, the folks that the United States were funding, uh, the Mujahideen in, uh, in Afghanistan, the Russians identified them as terrorists. We identified them as freedom fighters until uh, they attacked us. Good afternoon, Lee. Good family. All right, anyway, I uh, had meetings to do all of a sudden, and uh, I'm back. So, uh, wow, I wonder what you guys were talking about while I was gone. <laughs> anyway, all right, so, we, uh, so, so anyway, the important point of this is, is that um, if our enemy is, quote-unquote, terrorism or terrorists, then this really complicates something. Um, if our enemy is Iraq, as, as with the Persian Gulf War, it's relatively easy to identify who the target is. But our, I, of our enemy being terrorism or terrorists, even if we're going to go that far, that really becomes problematic, and it adds a layer of complication to how we're going to fight this particular war. Um, and also, uh, whenever you have a situation in which you see um, political or social instability, this is a really ripe climate for people who have relatively extreme ideas to empower themselves, especially when we create power vacuums by, oh, I don't know, taking out the leader of a country. Um, this really becomes an opportunity for um, for some uh, for very uh, charismatic leaders and uh, some relatively extreme leaders, especially when people are living under extreme circumstance. Uh, people who have extreme ideas become a lot more attractive. So, um, so we do start to see, especially in the Middle East, um, the rise of religious fundamentalism. Now, I can make a sociological argument that we also see the rise of religious fundamentalism elsewhere in the world. Um, but that's for a sociology course that I'll put together later on. Um, anyway, uh, these idea, this idea of terrorism, although the idea of being at war or terrorism is relatively new, the idea of, of having to deal with terrorists and terrorism isn't. Uh, so, for instance, back when we talked about the 1979 Iran hostage crisis, that was... <coughs> That was uh, identified in terms of terrorism. During the 1980s, we had a string of airline hijacks, airline hijackings, um, you know, terrorists taking over airplanes uh, to try to get their demands met. Um, we had the assassination of Anwar Sadat. Uh, and uh, during this particular time period, so um, and and then uh, you know later on the the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, we, uh, you know, uh, you know, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, so uh, so we actually have targeted assassinations of world leaders taking place as a result of these uh, as a result of uh, terrorist actions. Also, too, uh, probably one of the most extreme in the 1980s was the. Um, was the car bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut. Uh, we, uh, President Reagan had sent Marines into Beirut to stabilize um, the situation there. Clearly didn't work. Ultimately had to remove the, the Marines from Beirut, um, uh, largely as a result of this particular attack. Um, but now foremost among, uh, among these uh, terrorist groups, however, uh, emerged one particular group that was especially effective, that was especially well-financed and, um, and especially well-trained and well-disciplined, and that was Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda was a terrorist organization led by uh, this fellow here, Osama bin Laden, although the Al-Qaeda network was, uh, was fairly dispersed and, um, and uh, kind of cellular, uh, at least the, the, the titular head was um, was this fellow Os Osama bin Laden? Now Osama bin Laden, his uh, his particular political agenda was one of jihad, uh, a war against non-Muslims, and uh, specifically the United States. Well, wh why? Why? Why did he want to declare war against the United States? We're nice folks. Why would he do that? Well. 
Um, it wasn't necessarily because we were wealthy and because we were free. Switzerland is wealthy and free, and he didn't have uh, declare a jihad against Switzerland, no. Uh, he had an agenda. He has a political agenda, and this is the case with terrorists, uh, political terrorists especially. Uh, I have a political agenda that I want to, uh, to, uh, to put into effect. My rival, my opponent, is extremely powerful, much more powerful than I am, so I'm going to have to use, if I'm going to use violence, I'm going to have to use some pretty extreme uh, methods of violence. Uh, and in his in this case, and in the case of Al-Qaeda, the, uh, the main grievances that he had was the U.S. relationship with Israel, as well as the fact that as a result of the uh, Persian Gulf War, the United States had soldiers, had troops that were stationed in Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Um, to, by the Muslim tradition, Saudi Arabia is basically a holy land. It is the place of Mecca and Medina. Um, and, um, and the idea of having foreign troops on holy soil is something that was egregious to Osama, Osama bin Laden. Um, now, are these things worth blowing people up and killing people? Well, of course not. But um, for these guys, this was their mission. This was their goal. Um, and uh, so, we, so we see Al-Qaeda... Um, you know, first making its name for uh, a name for itself uh, with the uh, with a uh, with the with an attack against the World Trade Center in 1993, bringing in a uh, a a van full of explosives, trying to bring down the buildings. Uh, one of the buildings using these this explosive uh, via this vehicle full of explosives didn't work. It did, however, blow up the garage. There were casualties. Um, and it kind of puts this guy on the radar. Uh, later on, about 10 years later, we also see the uh, Al-Qaeda attacking using a, a, a boat full of explosives, a U.S. Uh, a battleship called the USS Cole. Um, so, uh, so this guy is going to attack, and, and we, we see these attacks coming. Uh, and therefore, we're well aware of what Al-Qaeda wants. We're well aware of things that Al-Qaeda is, is willing to do to get what they want. Um, so on September 11th, um, the first name that we see, and of course, you know, so one of the things that we have to understand that, that, that are significant to this particular video and to these videos that we've, we've had is, this is history that I was able to participate in, that I was around to actually witness. So on September 11, of course, I'm teaching a class, and I am informed that a plane has hit the World Trade Center, and there it is suspected that this is terrorist. And I remember uh, going upstairs, we had kind of this uh, uh, this old classroom, an old TV set with no cable attachment, so we had to, you know, link our arms to, to, uh, to make an antenna so we could see what was going on on, this, uh, uh, on September 11th. And we noticed, and we got tuned in just in time, basically, to see the second plane hit the towers. This is definitely a terrorist attack, right? Um, well, the first name that came to my mind that I actually wrote on the board, Osama bin Laden, except I misspelled it. But I, it's the same guy. It's this guy here, Osama bin Laden. Um, and, it, and fairly quickly, uh, our focus uh, was put on um, Osama bin Laden. So on September 11th, um, terrorists associated with the terrorist group Al-Qaeda, uh, largely Saudi Arabians, um, boarded four planes, hijacked those planes, and used them as weapons. Two of those planes struck the World Trade Towers, um, ultimately bringing the World Trade Towers down um, in a just absolutely dramatic uh, freefall. Um, and another attack was against the Pentagon, uh, in which the plane was flown into the front uh, end of the Pentagon, and then the fourth plane never actually reached its target due to the uh, to the d courageous actions of the passengers uh, taking c control of the or trying to take control of the plane away from these terrorists. They ended up crashing uh, and giving up their lives in Pennsylvania. Um, so the, now the president of the time, George George W. Bush, as uh, you know, he was not particularly popular president at that point. Um, but now where the nation is going to turn to him. And in essence, he is going to issue what is going to become known as the Bush Doctrine. In other words, um, the United States is at war with terrorism, and uh, any, and we're not going to differentiate people who harbor terrorists from the terrorists themselves. Well, this is going to become especially apt in the nation of Afghanistan. So in, a, in Afghanistan, we see uh, this is where Osama bin Laden has some training camps. He's living in Afghanistan. He has training Al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan. The, uh, the uh, government of Afghanistan, a, a, a religious set, uh, group called the Taliban, um, knows where he is. They have access to him. And President Bush says, hey, look, you're going to have to turn over, uh, uh, you know, um, Osama bin Laden and his officers to us. Uh, we want him in the in the United States. 
given to us now. And um, Afghanistan, uh, the uh, Taliban, makes a mistake. Um, they basically start to negotiate with the United States. Uh, well, you know, we don't necessarily want to turn him over. We need to see evidence that he was involved. Osama bin Laden denied being involved in the, uh, in the attacks. Uh, we need to see evidence that, that, that he was actually involved. Well, mm, you're not going to ask evidence of the United States after it's just been attacked. We told you to turn him over, uh, and now we're going to bomb and blow up your country, and that's exactly what the United States did. Um, again, understand that I was involved in this process, except I was involved in this process with regard to the peace movement. The Afghanistan, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan was hugely popular in the United States, approved of in the United States. We understood Afghanistan as being the enemy. I, on the other hand, were, was active in, um, in not supporting and speaking out against this particular war, uh, largely because from my perspective, if I didn't see what bombing and, uh, and destroying a nation that was already re largely destroyed was going to do to, uh, to better the war on terrorism. Of course, this is my particular personal bias. Um, so the students should be, con should be warned that, um, that I may not be right, uh, you know, that, that I may have been entirely wrong in my assessment of this. But either way, um, the United States does invade Afghanistan uh, within relatively short order. We have overthrown the Taliban, but now what do we do? Um, so uh, we, the Taliban is well, uh, you know, well entrenched in the country. Uh, also, Afghanistan is full of a whole bunch of different tribal communities, uh, many of which have different political uh, alliances. They have different political interests, um, and they are all armed. Um, so, uh, so then we turn to a guy we kind of establish, um, you know, our allies during this was, was a group called the Northern Alliance. Um, and this Northern Alliance kind of got together and said, yeah, we'll help you out. And we were able to overthrow the Taliban. Now, the Taliban is not to be missed. They were, they were a pretty brutal, uh, oppressive regime, uh, throwing acid on women. It was blowing up world monuments, uh, a, a strict theocratic uh, uh, dictatorship. Um, but many people in the Northern Alliance weren't all that much better. Eventually, the United States is going to settle on a fellow by the name of Hamid Karzai to take over in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, for the United States, Hamid Karzai was not particularly well liked in Afghanistan, and his, uh, you know, his time as as president of Afghanistan was contentious. Um, consequently, we ended up fighting a bunch of tribal wars uh, in Afghanistan, and also we kept fighting the comeback of the Taliban and those people who were allied with the Taliban. Um, Afghanistan remains an unstable country, and our and at least ten thousand of our soldiers still is, are still in Afghanistan to try to stabilize that country with um, with middling su success at best. Uh, President Bush is also going to get on, and he is going to give what is what becomes known as the Axis of Evil speech, in which he identifies um, three nations, especially as being uh, especially egregious um, supporters of terrorism. Uh, those nations were Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. He identifies these countries as an axis of evil, and then, of course, um, we're going to proceed to, uh, to invade Iraq, which, of course, is quite the warning shot for Afghanistan, uh, I'm sorry, for Iran and North Korea. Uh, some other measures that were put into place as a result of September 11th, still largely contentious. Um, for instance, the USA Patriot Act uh, was put into effect to, uh, presumably to try to make it easier to identify terrorists. Um, you know, of course, this becomes the, the main focus of our, of our society. According to George Bush, uh, today our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom, came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly attacks, uh, terrorist acts. Thousands of lives, actually, it turned out to be about 3,000 of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon of freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. So all of us, we are associating this particular attack as an attack against our very freedoms. Uh, so in order to, of course, uh, you know, to preserve that freedom, we're going to pass laws like the USA Patriot Act, which, of course, made it easier for the state to, uh, to surveil uh, made, and detain and, um, and uh, you know, <laughs> stop terrorists. Of course, the surveillance was not just on terrorists and wasn't ju just necessarily targeted toward, um, toward detaining, uh, detaining only the bad guys. Uh, many... many uh, co uh, <laughs> criticisms of the Patriot Act is that, well, wait a minute, you're also using this against, say, activist groups and uh, otherwise uh, 
you know, uh, innocent Americans, uh, that, uh, that, this is, that this has become problematic. Regardless, the USA Patriot Act will be um, renewed and updated uh, later on. Um, thousands of, uh, of largely Muslim men were rounded up in the United States and brought down to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, uh, where they remained detained without trial. Um, it ultimately, almost all of them released, except for a small handful that yet remain in Guantanamo, despite the fact that the President Obama has signed and said that we're going to close Guantanamo down six years ago. Well, whatever. Um, also, too, we see the, uh, the, the uh, rearrangement of our intelligence complex. Look, the reality is, is that September 11 was a colossally uh, bad intelligence breakdown. What went wrong? It's not like we didn't know about these guys, and it's not like there wasn't even warning. I uh, come to find out there were warnings that we were going to be attacked, although not necessarily attacked on September 11th. Um, so what we uh, needed to do is we needed to homogenize our intelligence services. We needed to kind of bring them together. And that's exactly what we did under um, when, uh, when we uh, created the Department of Homeland Security, which is supposed to consolidate our intelligence arms, the NSA, the CIA, uh, DEA, um, the uh, Transit Authority, the Immigration Services. We're going to kind of bring them all under one roof so that we can maximize our ability to protect our homeland. Also, we... Um, as a result of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks, uh, we decided that there needed to be one guy who was going to be our center guy, or in some cases, uh, one girl, uh, is going to be our center, our focal point for dealing with terrorism, and we created the National Intelligence Director, um, who was in charge of, 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 uh, of organizing all of our in intelligence-involved branches at the federal level. So, uh, so a lot of changes, a lot of structural changes are taking place as a result of September 11th. With very little question from the American people, of course, you know, things like the Patriot Act would have been absolutely impossible before seven, uh, September 11th, but um, now the American people are willing to, because of fear, we're willing to open ourselves up to, uh, to intensive surveillance and intensive scrutiny, and even to, maybe what we could say, um, violations of our privacy rights and our rights of security against the state. Um, now, um, we have, of course, invaded Afghanistan. It was, uh, it was the actual invasion itself. If the mission was to topple the Taliban, that was successful. We did that. If the mission was to get Osama bin Laden, yeah, we didn't get him in that mission. Um, also, we found ourselves in a position where uh, if we left Afghanistan, there was no way of predicting who was going to be able to take, who was going to take over in Afghanistan. In other words, we could have created a, another terrorist state. Um, you know, we could have turned this country over to extremists who would have been worse for us than the Taliban. So we were pretty well committed to staying in, the, in Afghanistan in order to rebuild this country. Now, the U.S. military, of course, is absolutely a perfect machine for toppling governments. It, it's really, really good. Um, but for building governments, eh, not so much. But keeping ourselves busy in Afghanistan wasn't quite enough. We also had to go after uh, Iraq. Now, again, uh, my position on this was anti. Um, and this was a little bit easier to be anti uh, because this was a little bit more contentious of an issue. But, um, but the background here is that uh, we already had had a war with, um, with Saddam Hussein, uh, but he was never toppled. The, pre the first President Bush was never toppled. Well, many of the people who were working for uh, George W. Bush's uh, campaign were old guys who worked for his dad. Um, and they were upset about the fact that Bush didn't actually, that the first Bush, Bush uh, the, the senior, I guess, um, didn't go into Iraq and, and uh, take uh, Saddam Hussein out. So they got upset, and they, they, this became their mission. In fact, uh, one of the first things that they wanted to, that they wanted to do when, when the uh, World Trade Towers were attacked on September 11th was in some way link it to Iraq so they could go into Iraq and take this guy out. Um, and it didn't work out that way. But a couple years later, we start to hear tell that, um, that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. Now, you've got to understand, after the Persian Gulf War, we had put very, very strict sanctions against Iraq. Um, they weren't allowed to have uh, anything that even could be remotely used at, and turned into a weapon of mass destruction to the point where they were having a resurgence of, uh, of a, a, a virus that was spread by sand fleas. This was a virus that had largely been white, white uh, wiped out before the Persian Gulf War, but now since the sanctions, this virus was coming back because they couldn't get their hands on the pesticides needed to get rid of these, uh, to get rid of these, uh, the, these uh, the sand fleas. So um, we were, we had also conducted a number of bombing runs. Uh, now uh, the um, the 
uh, in the weapons inspectors had been removed from Iraq uh, as a result of one of the bombing missions that was conducted by President Clinton, uh, and they had never returned. So there were whispers that, you know, during that time period, from 1998 until 2003, Saddam Hussein was starting to get his weapons of mass destruction back. Um, so, um, so our reasons for going into, our, into Iraq was, hey, look, um, Iraq is a terrorist state. They fund terrorists. They hate the United States for what we've done to them. And Saddam Hussein is amassing large amounts of weapons of mass destruction that he can use against American cities. Um, and we have to go in there. We have to take him out before he uses these weapons of mass destruction, including the possibility of using nuclear weapons against the United States. Um, we also, uh, we also see that, that uh, Saddam Hussein has links to uh, Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda, uh, that he, they may be plotting together, and they may be wanting to attack the United States. And also, hey, let's face it, Saddam Hussein's a pretty brutal guy. Um, he, he's, uh, he brutally uh, slaughtered uh, thousands of Kurds. Uh, he, he holds his own country together through brutal repression. He's not a good man. So we need to take this guy out. And... Um, and so these were the reasons that we had for uh, going in and invading Iraq. Well, turns out that it, we were only shooting about 33%. Yes, in fact, Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator, and, and uh, the world is probably better off without Saddam Hussein. However, it turns out uh, he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, and in fact, uh, not only was he not collaborating with Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden actually hated Saddam Hussein because Saddam Hussein was not a true Muslim. He was a secular leader. But regardless, during this time, uh, we put into, uh, we go to the United Nations. Of course, George Bush built a, uh, just like his predecessors, he built a, um, uh, a UN uh, collaboration to go into Afghanistan. We're going to try to do the same thing with Iraq. But a lot of people are saying, well, really, why do you want to invade Iraq? So uh, the, US, the UN, I'm sorry, I should say UN Security Council passed a resolution 1441, which said, hey, look, um, Saddam Hussein, you've got to disarm. You've got to get rid of your weapons of mass destruction. And of course, um, Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction, so he could not disarm. And this was used as evidence that he was not following through with this UN resolution. Uh, shortly before the invasion in, uh, in 2003, Secretary of State Colin Powell gets up in front of the United Nations and gives his case, the U.S. case against Iraq, much of which was refuted by later investigations. Um, and, uh, and he brings in evidence that Saddam Hussein has these weapons of mass destruction and he is a threat to the rest of the world. However, it, like I said, it was refuted shortly thereafter, and much of the world didn't quite buy into this. Um, most of the major countries did not want to be involved in a war in Iraq. Um, I, most specifically, uh, this, the idea that the Bush administration was drumming up a war against Iraq became relatively common throughout the world, although it was not necessarily common in the United States. In the United States, we were very concerned about the possibility of being attacked again like we were on 9-11, which is a very real possibility. We can't rule that out. So, um, and we were hearing messages from our elected officials about the ominous mushroom cloud that could, you know, rise above our cities if we did not act and act decisively. Uh, yet, Despite this, on February 15th, 2003, it actually turned out on February 15th and 16th, uh, 2003, um, for the very, very first time in the world, this is really an amazing thing from my perspective anyway, uh, as somebody who's, involved, who's been involved in the peace movement. Um, so on February 15th, 2003, uh, millions of us actually got together from all over the world and had one giant peace rally, one giant peace protest, to protest the, uh, uh, the impending war in Iraq. Now think about this on, in human terms. For the first time in human history, millions of people from all over the world acted in concert to protest a war that had not yet started. Amazing. And it's, in my opinion, is one of the, the better things that I ever was uh, involved in. It was a failure. <laughs> it obviously didn't work. Um, uh, in uh, March, in the middle of March of 2003, the United States does in fact invade Iraq, and they do it very much the same way that they invaded Iraq, uh, Kuwait in 1991 or invaded Afghanistan. They used a, uh, a, a tactic that was referred to as shock and awe. In other words, we're going to go in, we're going to bomb the daylights out of your, uh, out of your positions, and then we're going to move in with, with uh, just overwhelming military force. And it worked. Um, 
the, uh, the Iraqi army was unable to give much resistance at all, uh, many of them surrendering upon contact with the United States military, and uh, within relatively short order, the U.S. military was able to, to topple the regime of Saddam Hussein, prompting uh, President Bush to, uh, a couple months later, to uh, get on the, uh, the bridge of the USS Abraham Lincoln, as I recall, under a big banner that said, Mission Accomplished. Um, well, not quite. The mission wasn't quite accomplished. Yes, we managed to topple, ultimately capture Saddam Hussein, who was later executed by the Iraqi people, uh, by an Iraqi tribunal. Um, but the mission wasn't quite accomplished, because just like in Afghanistan, we had a situation where we had multiple factions um, you know, that were in conflict with each other, that were being held down by Saddam Hussein, but were now in a state of conflict with each other. So there were some complications that we had to deal with in Iraq before we were able to leave. Um, again, the religious conflicts that were taking place between Kurdish groups, uh, Shiite groups, Sunni groups, and the leaders of those particular communities who now were in a position to exploit this power vacuum that existed now that, uh, that Saddam Hussein was gone. Um, we also learned one of the complications started to happen in the United States. People started to turn away from the war because we started to learn uh, that there were no weapons of mass destruction, that much of what we had been told about the Iraq war was in fact uh, a, a lie. Um, now, there, there's some content that, that is a contentious statement on my part. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, counter, uh, the, the, the counter argument is that uh, we, the best evidence that we had at the time led us to believe that he had weapons of mass destruction. That is not true. Um, I remember reading uh, articles written by people who had been to Iraq. They were weapons inspectors, and they were saying there are no weapons of mass destruction there. And consequently, when it was discovered that there were no weapons of mass destruction, a teacher in South Florida like me was not surprised. I already knew. And yet, if I knew, the President of the United States had to have known. He has access to much better information than I do. Um, so it was a lie. Now, it could very well be that the administration lied to itself and refused to accept the evidence that, that there were no weapons of mass destruction. But Regardless, the premise of the war was a lie. Um, and this became revealed, and people started to back out of their support for this particular war. Uh, also, word of American abuses that took place in, in Iraq eh, came out. Not so much in Afghanistan, but, but in Iraq, especially the abuses that were heaped upon prisoners of war uh, in Abu Ghraib prison. Um, and also a big problem is the government that was installed in Iraq was largely installed by the United States, and it was perceived to be illegitimate by the people who lived in Iraq at that time. Uh, and it's very difficult for a government to get people to do what it want, needs them to do if it is perceived to be illegitimate. So the United States, even though the mission, the, the mission itself had been accomplished um, within months, ended up spending years in Iraq trying to straighten things out. It did not work. When we, the United States left Iraq, um, it was still an unstable state and remains that way. And now, as I'm speaking today, Americans are still flying uh, uh, bombing missions over Iraq to try to um, you know, drive out uh, extremist, uh, you know, extremist influences in the form of ISIS uh, that are trying to make headway in Iraq today. When will this end? It's impossible to say. We've created unstable situations in these countries, and now what is our responsibility for stabilizing those countries? And that is a question that we have not actually effectively answered yet. Um, now, terrorism today. Um, for the most part, uh, again, kind of like with Vietnam, we're really not particularly interested in uh, in large-scale uh, warfare anymore. We thought we had learned our lesson in Vietnam. For about 30 years, we had managed to keep ourselves in, in, uh, out of large-scale uh, warfare uh, and ongoing large-scale warfare. But in Afghanistan and Iraq, we ended up getting what the term is quagmired, bogged down in these countries, spending billions of, uh, maybe even trillions of dollars uh, to try to fight these wars and, um, and only effectively destabilizing those regions. So, um, so for the most part, since, uh, since 
the, uh, since about 2008, 2009, the goal has been withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we're also seeing the, uh, the, an increased use in private militaries. These are, these are military uh, institutions and organizations uh, in which people work for private contractors. Um, so the infamous Blackwater which has changed its name a number of times, so you can't find them in the phone book, uh, so to speak, and it, like anybody uses phone books anymore. Um, but these are, these are private companies that have a, milita a military. Private companies with their own armies. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and these civilians are oftentimes being contracted to do work uh, for the government. Uh, also, too, uh, smaller special forces operations that, are, um, that have been used. Um, more so, for instance, um, in 2010, when Osama bin Laden was ultimately found in Pakistan, not in Afghanistan, uh, it was a small special forces group, a specially trained uh, special forces outfit that went in and, um, and killed him. Um, also, too, we find ourselves uh, becoming more and more reliant on these, uh, these technological innovations, drones, or as I like to refer to them as flying killer robots. Um, using these drones, uh, uh, pil uh, pilots in Nevada can remotely operate their planes uh, in places all over the world. Um, they can conduct surveillance using these drones with very, very powerful, sophisticated cameras, and they can also shoot Hellfire missiles and take out uh, suspects like we did with uh, Anwar al alakai uh, some time ago. Um, now, um, we're opening up to, well, this is a global war on terror. So where are our battlefields? And this becomes a problem because a terrorist does not necessarily belong to any particular nation. Osama bin Laden himself was Saudi Arabian, living in Afghanistan. And when we invaded Afghanistan, he packed his little terrorist bags and he moved to Pakistan. Uh, he had been all over the world. So where are these terrorists and how do we fight them? I mean, if we find that there's a terrorist cell in Chicago, we're probably not going to bomb Chicago, right? If we find that there's a terrorist cell in Berlin, we're probably not going to bomb Berlin. And we shouldn't. Um, but if we find that there's a terrorist cell in Tora Bora, are we going to bomb Tora Bora? Well, if we shouldn't bomb Berlin, then maybe we shouldn't bomb Tora Bora. Maybe bombing is not the best way to deal with this particular problem. Um, well, if it isn't, then what is? Because clearly we have to do something about the terrorists. Um, so we're opening up new battlefields. Currently, we're, uh, we're using drones uh, in, uh, in places like Pakistan and Yemen. Uh, we, have a military, we have a military presence all over the world. Um, and, um, and we're using that military presence to try to hunt down the terrorists before they can attack us. This is a colossal change from the Cold War attitude that we had from, uh, you know, since World War II. It's a huge transformation from the moment, uh, from since the beginning of history, because the reality is, is that as far as other nations are concerned, yeah, we don't necessarily always get along with Russia or China, but we're probably not going to go to war with those countries. But here we are in a state of perpetual warfare, with folks who could be anywhere at any given time. This completely changes the nature of warfare and may be very transformative for the history of our country.